Well, this morning, uh, I'm going to thank you for uh, having me up here again. And this morning, I'm going to share with you about beastly envy. I have never come across a descriptor of envy being beastly. You know, we think of envy like green. Okay, now that's a story why it's green, but we're not going to go there. But this term beastly envy is not even a term created by me. It's from Psalm 73, written by this guy called Asaph. Who's Asaph? (laughs) Until I read Psalm 73, I didn't know who Asaph was. Okay, now he is, uh, we'll, we'll talk about him in a moment. But here's a man who went through and experienced envy in its most horrible form. All right, and he got through it and he wrote a psalm in retrospect to reflect on it so that, now when he did, when he wrote the psalm, I don't think he realized that one day it would be put into the Bible and that it would be read thousands of years later and it would, it would be kept being read until Jesus Christ comes back. But I'm thankful that it is in the Bible because it gives us a story of a human being just like you and me. You know, if I could get a time machine, I go back and I guess Asaph and bring him back here, put him into singlets and the shorts and his Japanese flip flops, take him to a coffee team and give him a bit of CKT, have some coffee, and we chat. I think we would just click like that from the human point of view that this is just a human being like you and I are, prone to all kinds of human emotions. Right, and so this is his story. Well, that was quick. All right. Asaph was from the tribe of Levi. So a very important person, you know, the, the Levites from the tribes of Israel, they were the ones chosen to be priests to the people. They were to be standing in between God and the Jews. They, they got their messages from God, gave it to the Jews, and they took the sins of the Jews and presented sacrifices to God on behalf of the Jews. A very important role, a very critical role where they were highly visible, all right, and the people knew who they were. So there was an expectation on the part of the people that the priests, the Levites, would be you know, playing, would be a people who were really uh, upright before the Lord. Now, he was also a worship leader uh, of the Tabernacle Choir. Now, I didn't realize tabernacles have choirs in those days, but they do. They did. Okay, so, and here is the descriptor. He appointed some of the Levites to minister before the Ark of the Lord to extol, thank, and praise the Lord, the God of Israel. Asaph was the chief. So, okay, this is a picture downloaded. You can imagine that that guy there on the top row on the left-hand side, you know, he's, he's got a slightly different outfit. So let's imagine that that's Asaph. He's the boss. Now, those of you who, who, who are bosses in some way or leaders in some way, you know that you impact the people that you're responsible for, your staff, okay, your employees. They look to you to lead them. They look to you for an example of good behavior. Obviously, they do. So Asaph is in a position, and you must remember this, okay, because this comes into play later on in my message. He had influence over all those people there. The way he lived his life would impact upon them. They would see for themselves the leadership that they expect of a man of God, a Levite priest. He was also a seer and prophet. King Hezekiah and his officials ordered the Levites to praise the Lord with the words of David and of Asaph the seer. So he was also responsible for proclaiming God's word. You know, okay, the local preacher, you might say. So you can see that this guy played a very important role. So let's look at Asaph and what he writes in Psalm 73. He makes a statement which sets the foundation. It sets the scene. God is good. Anytime that we come to relate with God, we need to have a fundamental foundation. God is good. Do things ever happen to you in your life where you say, God is mean, 
How come God this, this, does this to me? How come God? How come God? All right? You must have that straight foundation straight away. God is good. And then you look at things differently. But, so Asaph says, God is good to Israel. Okay, God is good. He's good to the whole nation. Then he makes an abrupt confession. He says, but as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. And this, I believe that he's regarding, so the one in the brackets are my thoughts, is regarding purity. Because he has just written about God is good to those who are pure in heart. And then immediately he says, but my feet almost slipped. So I think the connection is there with his purity before God. And that was a critical issue because of his position as a Levite. Okay, so here's a confession. And isn't this a gutsy thing? You know, this guy, he writes a confession. He doesn't mind. He's going to tell you. He's going to tell, because this is a psalm. It's a song. It's to be sung in times of celebration or in times of worship. And he doesn't mind people hearing about this. He wants you to know that he almost slipped. Why? Why did that almost happen? For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. There are two types of people here. The arrogant people and the wicked people. Like he envied them. Envy, simple definition is desiring that which I do not have. I don't have this. So I want it. <laughs> okay. And he envied them. Right? Two people. Two kinds of people. So very simply, well, you can see that. Envy, dark clouds in his mind, the arrogant and the wicked. These two people. Now, who are these wicked? Who are they? What is their position in life? Okay, now I'm just going to read you uh, from the NIV, but I've selected certain uh, points that I want highlighted, but I'll read the whole uh, verses to you. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from the burdens common to man. They are not plagued by human ills. Right. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. Now these are the, who the wicked are. This is their position in life. Life is really good for these people who are wicked. Now, Asaph is seeing this as he does his duties as the choir leader of the tabernacle. Okay? What, what is the response to the life? Now, these wicked, they have a life that is good. There is nothing wrong with having a life that is good. Okay, now, please don't get me wrong. Okay, so, so, so if you are well off, oh, you know, I, oh, I shouldn't be well off. No, I'm not saying that. If you are good at business and God has blessed you with the ability to do business and make money, go for it. Right? It is not that you are prosperous. It is what you do with it. It is your response to that. Okay? From their callous hearts comes iniquity. Now, this is the NIV translation, but the, the Hebrew actually says that their eyes swell through fatness. Okay, and the evil concedes no, no, no limits. What it's saying is that even though they have so much, their eyes look and want more. It's like, what, what do we say here? Your eyes are bigger than your stomach when it comes to food, that kind of thing. Okay. And it's a similar case. These people, they see, they want more, more and more. It is not sufficient for what they have. And therefore, they strive to get more. And it is striving in a manner which is not ethical. It is not a manner which is full of integrity in the way you make money. It is evil. They will stab you in the back. They will cheat you. They will do anything to accumulate their wealth. 
and they scoff and they speak with malice. In their arrogance, they threaten oppression. Their dealings with people are such that they will oppress other people. They are going to make life difficult for other people in order to get what it is that they want. Totally unethical, or no conscience whatsoever. You know, these people, when the Bible says that we were created in the image of God, you know, and that God gives us a God-like conscience, uh, these people look like they are totally devoid of the conscience. They've killed the conscience of God in their lives. And their mouths lay claim to heaven, and their tongues take possession of the earth. All right, I'll, I won't be too harsh on them here. When it says that their mouths lay claim to heaven, in the Hebrew, it doesn't mean that they claim to be like God. You know, they can behave like God. They are God-like. No. All it means is that they have the earth. You know, their the influence is pervasive. Any place on the earth uh, that has wealth or has money, they lay claim to it. Wow, if they could, they would even say heaven belongs to us. The heavens belong to us. If they could, we claim the clouds. You know, we claim the rain. We, we claim everything. That is how much the arrogance is for these people. Verse 10, Therefore their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. These people have followers. They have people who crowd around them, who, who want to take from them what they have to give. You might call them Cronies, okay? These are their followers. And no matter how evil these people are, the followers don't care. They don't see the evil. All they see is the... And that's it. And that's fine. Conscience doesn't matter. Okay? Human dignity doesn't matter. Just give me my share <laughs> and I will follow you. That's what these people are saying. All right? And they, they drink it up in the uh, verse. They, say they drink it up in abundance. These followers get lots and lots, enough to keep them from leaving these wicked and arrogant people. And this is what they say now, the wicked and the arrogant, who, who are these people? Uh, let's, let's, Asaph is working in the uh, tabernacle. All right. and there is some suggestion that these are some of his co-workers of, of his same position, same ranking. So these are tabernacle or temple officials. All right. They are arrogant. And then, of course, those are, they are his fellow Jews. Maybe not related to the temple, but they are very rich and they're very powerful people, high society people. Okay, so these are the people that he sees as he tries to do his job. And these people say, how would God know? I mean, this is their challenge. This is the challenge of the arrogant and the wicked. How would God know? Does the Most High know Anything. Now, this is NIV, but other translations put it in a different way, some even stronger. Basically, they're saying, does God really see what's going on? Can God see? That's another translation. Okay. Can God possibly know what's going on? <laughs> that is so incredibly scary. You know, these are people, they are the Jews, they're supposed to be God's chosen people. They have a history of being delivered from Egypt. Their ancestors saw the you know, cloud of smoke, all right? pillar of fire. They see God's deliverance, and now they say, does God really know anything? <laughs> I find that incredible that anyone would dare to say that. But they did. So this is a serious challenge. Does God really know what's going on? On the part of, of this arrogant and the wicked, uh, they don't think it's a serious challenge. Now, Asaph could be going on in his mind. Now, Asaph wrote this. He said that these people said that. 
So the fact that Asaph wrote this in reflection, this is after the event, what was going on in his mind? Would his mind say, God, yeah, God, do you really know what's going on? How come these people can get away with what they're doing? Asaph, he responds, and he says, this is what the wicked are like. Always carefree. <laughs> They have a great life, always carefree, and they increase in wealth. Man, God, I want to be there. You know? I want to have some of that. Why not? Mm. <laughs> okay. And then he says, look at me. Look at me. Look at what's going on with me. Surely in vain. Oh, yeah, what's the point, la? Surely in vain. Why bother? Okay. I have kept my heart pure. I haven't done any of these things that the arrogant and wicked have done. Okay? In vain, and he repeats again, in vain I have washed my hands in innocent. That means whatever he does is innocent. It's good. It doesn't hurt other people. He's trying to do what God wants him to do. He's trying to follow Okay. All day long I have been plagued. I have been punished every morning. Now this is an interesting verse. I mean, punished by who? <laughs> we can only speculate that if he has seen the arrogant and the wicked are the temple officials that he's working with, I think it is these people. These are his co-workers. Maybe these are his seniors who are corrupt who are wicked, who are arrogant, and they give him a hard time. Ay, yeah. Why be so holy? Come. <laughs> okay. We, we can give you a little if you want. Take la. <laughs> and Asap says no. And they, and they give me a hard time for worshipping and being true to God. Sometimes, you know, you want to stand for Jesus Christ. It can be difficult, okay? It can be difficult to be holy and say, no, thus says the Lord, according to Scripture. So, was it going through his mind? Is pursuing righteousness really worth it? Huh, really? Worth it or not? No, not worth it. Not worth it. You know, that thought could have come into his mind. Okay? And it is a test for all of us. When we look at what people have sometimes, they are arrogant. Now, Asaph knew that they are arrogant and wicked because he describes it right at the very beginning. He says, they are arrogant, they are wicked. And you would think that someone with some sort of spirituality would know that these are arrogant and wicked. Therefore, we hold back from them. We don't envy them. But such is the wealth. Such is the easy life that these people are having. It is so amazingly great that he is drawn into what they have even though he knows they're arrogant and wicked. Sometimes we know, we know we shouldn't be going there, <laughs> you know, but the attraction is just so strong, hard to resist. Okay. And this is even the more difficult part for him. Despair to self, despair to others. If I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed your children when I tried to understand all this, it was oppressive to me. What's he saying here? He has enough spirituality left in him. He has enough to realize that in the state that he was in, in this state of envy, and it's like a beast, you know, it's tearing him up. It's ripping him apart. He knows that if he opened his mouth to speak to his people, to his choir, to those that were under him, his employees, his team, whoever they are. And he said, I envy the wicked and the arrogant. Oh, I want what they have. You know, how come God doesn't give me these things? Huh? How come, how come, how come? He's saying, if I had opened my mouth and I said that, 
I would have betrayed your children. He would have impacted on all those people negatively. Because their minds would have also turned and said, Oh, yeah, Allah. How come God doesn't give all these things? Oh, we are righteous, we are pure, we try and do what He wants. But look at these other people, they have so much more than we have. You know, we have you know, basic stuff. Leaders, it is so important that if you are going through difficult stages, and, and we are human beings, we do, you have to be so careful. I'm not talking leaders, any, you know, a leader is anyone who has influence over others. You don't have to to have a title of leader <laughs> or manager. The fact that you may have a very um, forceful personality, you might be a very assertive person, but people look up to you. You have no title in the church, let's say in the church, you know, but you, you, people look up to you for some reason or other. They respect you. You are a leader. If you are going through something like what Asaph did with envy and you speak thus, and you let go, you will negatively impact your people. Be careful. And Asaph had enough sense to be careful to not open his mouth when he was going through this, this stage. You know, you know, zip your lips, okay? Don't speak until you resolve this issue. And when he was trying to understand all this, it was very oppressive to him. He was trying to understand honesty, spirituality, faithfulness to God. Wicked people got so much more than me. He's trying to work it out. You know, and there's a, a swirling in his brain. Not a good place to be. And then the light turns on. Bing! <laughs> okay. And this is the hinge of Psalm 73. This is where Psalm 73 turns. All right? There is to be a place that when you are confused, when you are in a place where it is just so difficult for you, there is a place where it turns. But whether it turns or not is totally up to you. Up to you. Till I entered the sanctuary of God, then I understood their destiny. There is a moment in time, till... You have to choose a moment in time when you walk. You choose to do something. It's a moment in time. All right? Asaph could have continued in his envy for a month, a year, 10 years, and he would be torn and torn still, you know, by envy. He had to choose a moment in time when he said, Enough. And the choice is made. I entered. He had to make a choice. Life is full of choices. And this is a choice that you have to make. You can stew in... Okay, let's look at this situation. Now. You can stew in your envy. You can burn and suffer in it. And you choose to do that. Because you, it, it, it's a funny thing. Yes? Self-pity... Self-anger, it's a self-perpetuating thing. I've been there. And it stirs in it, and you kind of like it. You know, you actually like it. It's like, oh, I like these feelings of anger. You know, I, 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 I'm so angry about something. I'm so envious. And you just let it bubble away. And it becomes, has a life of its own. So, till I entered, you make a choice. Where? The sanctuary of God. Well, for him, we don't know where the sanctuary is or was, whether he entered the temple or whether he just, in his mind, his heart, he just went before God in a quiet place, knelt down and said, God, I need some answers here. I need some help desperately. Okay? You go to God. Don't go and ask your friend. Your friends can help you. Yes, you know, they can give you advice. But you need to address, in our case, you go into the presence of Jesus Christ. You pray and say, I have these issues, Lord. It's burning me up. It's killing me and I don't like it. Then the revelation comes. Then, then I understood. Pow! The light turns on. And from here, the whole situation is reversed. 
you will see that his mind just, he sees the perspective from God's point of view, not his point of view. And then he sees the consequences of the wicked. Okay. And he says, Surely you place them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed? Completely swept away by terrors. They are like a dream. When one awakes, so when you arise, O Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. Okay. Look at how they, Asaph now sees the wicked. The wicked and the arrogant have a time. They have a period when they enjoy all these things. They have a period when they can shake their hand and say, Does God know? After Asaph has been in God's presence, he sees. God says, These people will have their time. Now, it's interesting that he says here, as a dream when one awakes, so when you arise, O Lord. Now, we know that God doesn't sleep as such. God is always aware of what's going on. I believe that Asaph wrote this to give the impression that God is allowing these people. So it is as if God's asleep, as if God doesn't know what's going on. But God does. But God is giving these people their moment in time, that little few years that they're going to have. And then when God executes judgment, it will be like these people never existed. They are like fantasies. So Asaph realizes, why am I being envious of these people? They are going to be gone. They're, they're, like, they're like shadows. Is it hard? Don't think so, because these people have shaken their hands at God. Is the judgment of God warranted? Yes. Okay. So he confesses, when my heart was grieved, okay, it is all my, look at it, it's all focused on myself. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. It's like you lose your senses. I was a brute beast before you. Now, in the NIV, it says, before you. In other versions, it says, I was a brute beast toward you, against you. Notice that Asaph is not saying that I was a brute beast towards the arrogant or the wicked. Like, I got angry at the arrogant and I told them off. I got angry at the, uh, the wicked and I scolded them. No, he's saying, I was a brute beast toward you. My behavior to you, God, was awful. So, you know, we look at being a beast. In the Hebrew, the beast is just beast, an okay, animal, wild animal. So I looked up the dictionary and I said, okay, what does being a beast mean in our English language today? And these are some of the things that came up. Okay? So these are the behaviors. If someone says to you, hey, you are really beastly, lah. you know, <laughs> they're saying this of you, Right? Okay, now the thing is that these words were not being used uh, by Asaph against the arrogant and wicked. He was behaving like this towards God. In a way, he was kind of shaking his fist. All right, God, why? Okay. Then there's a restoration. Now, Remember now that he is writing this psalm after the event. He's recovered from his envy attack. Yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will take me into glory. Now I see he turns and says, God, I was always with you. So even when he was in his envious state. God never let him go. You know, when we get into situations where we think God has left us, no, God never left us. It's we who left God. God is holding our right hand. Your right hand, you know, if you're right-handed, is your hand where you execute actions. It's where you make decisions. It's where you make your uh, intentions known. 
So that hand God is holding, because if you're left-handed, we can change that to you hold me by my left hand, all right? If you're a left-handed person, <laughs> okay? And then it says, when holding my hand, the hand which I make my life decisions and which I take my action, God, you're going to guide me. So now we have uh, this man having seen the, the real story. He asked a rhetorical question. There were strong and rhetorical questions in the last couple of weeks. Whom have I in heaven but you? Of course, the answer is no one, uh, no one else but you, God. Whom have I in heaven but you? It's just making a point. You, know? you are the only true God that really matters. Nothing in earth uh, my flesh and my heart and fail, but you are my strength of my heart and my portion forever. That word portion, you know, you can reinterpret that in Hebrew as you are my inheritance forever. So God, I am yours, but you are mine too. That relationship is established. Okay. Just to round up this message, how does it apply to us today? And I'm going to tell you that keeping righteousness is never in vain. All right? Pursue righteousness. You see, in 1 Corinthians, it says that, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. I chose this particular text because it has to do with work. You know, Asaph's work as as a, as a seer, his work as the tabernacle leader, being faithful in his work, getting a hard time. And yet Paul here says to the, to the Corinthians, don't give up. It's amazing that he says that to the Corinthian church, because the Corinthian church were a... <laughs> they were a, how to say, a naughty church, you know. They were a church where they were not really concerned about worshipping God that much. They were more into celebrating, eating, drinking, suing one another. <laughs> right? But Paul says to them, brothers and sisters, you know, Paul is an amazing guy. I mean, the Corinthian church, like the Galatian church, okay, they were all over the place. They were not being what they should be. But Paul still calls them brothers and sisters. He's loves them. You know, he, he loves his, the churches that he, he was involved with. So he's saying to them, don't give up. Keep on keeping on in your labor in the Lord. For those of you here in CLC, you know, uh, no matter who you are, you know, in the talk last night in the Galatians, I was saying that uh, some of the most important people in the church are the ushers. All right? I'm not saying that, that the chairman isn't important or the pastor's aren't important, okay? Everyone that works here, you're important. Okay? When you serve, don't give up. It is not in vain. And then Paul finishes by saying, well, I will finish by saying, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with you I pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I want to focus on this. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. There is a work that is begun in you as a follower of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is molding you shaping you more and more into the image of Christ. Okay. And maybe part of that molding and that shaping could be painful. Okay. The, the image that's often used is, is a potter. You know, the potter makes the pot from a bowl, bowl of clay and eh, suddenly you get this amazing pot. It can be out of shape, so they, they whack it so it's out of shape or it might have a bit too much clay, so they rip some clay out to make a perfect pot. And so in our lives, as we grow in Christ, some things need to be hit in place, some things need to be taken out. It could be painful. But we are being changed into the image of Jesus Christ. And in our service, along the way, as we, as we move along the way, old habits might come up. Some of these old habits might be 
envy. Envy might come knocking on the door of your heart. Let me in. Okay? Please don't. All right? And continue growing in Jesus Christ. So thank you for the, for the time this morning. And I hope we learn from the life of Asaph, for the courage of this man to realize at one point in time that even though he was afflicted, yet he knew that he had to go into the presence of God. Then the perspective changes. See life from God's perspective, not from your own.